Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. This is the military in Hawaii. Today, we're going to talk about the 9th Mission Support Command uh, with Brigadier General Timothy Connolly. Welcome to the show, General. Thanks, Jerry. I appreciate you having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Sure. Well, tell us what the uh, Ninth Mission Support Command is. Uh, you're running it. Uh, how big is it? And I, I get the idea that it's uh, about supporting the reserve. Am I right? Well, more specifically, it's actually about, about supporting U.S. Army Pacific and uh, and COM Indo-PACOM. So uh, the commander of Indo-PACOM, Admiral Aquilino, and the commanding general of uh, U.S. Army Pacific, uh, General Flynn, uh, the, the 9th Mission Support Command is an Army Reserve formation as opposed to an active component formation. Uh, but we're, we're unique in that most Army Reserve formations uh, across the continental United States are assigned to the U.S. Army Reserve Command. The 9th Mission Support Command is unique in that we're an Army Reserve unit, but we're headquarters, but we're, we're actually assigned to uh, U.S. Army Pacific uh, and under their operational control, which gives the U.S. Army Pacific um, immediate access to being able to use our capabilities uh, anywhere they're needed. Where, where's your command located? Is it Camp Smith or somewhere else? No, uh, we're located on Fort Chapter. Um, there's about 3,500 soldiers in the command. About half of them are here in Hawaii. But the other half are spread equitably, as I like to say, uh, between two locations up in Alaska at Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson and Fort Wainwright. Uh, we have, we're the only Department of Defense presence down in American Samoa, and we also have a great Army Reserve Center and, and, and uh, Ar Army Reserve soldiers from the 9th MSC out in Guam and Saipan. Uh, in fact, in Saipan, uh, which is a separate American territory from Guam, which is also an American territory, uh, CNMI and, and Saipan is part of uh, the Commonwealth of the Northern, Northern Marianas Islands, and in Saipan, we're the, also the only DOD presence in Saipan. Uh, I also have uh, a, a brigade level headquarters stationed at Camp Humphreys in, in Korea uh, and a detachment uh, at uh, Camp Zama in Japan that works with uh, U.S. Army Japan. So, uh, but before I go forward, I have a lot of questions for you. I just want to tell you. That when, I, when I was in the service, I, I was ordered to fly from, um, let's see, with Yokosuka uh, in Japan to the East Coast. And they put me on this kind yeah. of Space A flight uh, that, 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 that stopped in Elmendorf. And I had my tropical khakis with me, <clears throat> and it was freezing. And, and I never, you know, I couldn't get on the downline flight. So I sat there for 24 hours in the airport at Elmendorf. Um, uh, I guess it was an Air Force facility, and, um, and and I waited 24 hours for the next leg of the of the flight. And as a result, El Elmendorf has left an impression on me from then till now. I still think of it in terms of sitting there freezing my Okoli off for a full day. Elmendorf, Alaska. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how your experiences in the service all burn a hole in your brain. <laughs> I, I would always think that a flight from Japan to the to the continent of the United States would pass through Hawaii. So, so maybe you drew the short stick, <laughs> uh, short especially stick. if it was the winter. It, yeah, uh, it was a short straw, I should say. Yeah, but uh, but for sure, uh, Alaska is beautiful. In the in the uh, you know, and I'll answer all your questions. I got so many great stories to tell about this command. I was just in Alaska a month ago. Uh, out on Kodiak Island, watching our engineers uh, do a road construction project, um, and it was just beautiful. It's beautiful up there this time of year, but uh, if you went through the dead of winter, uh, yes, you will suffer. <laughs> so, so, so tell me what uh, you know. What does the support command do with these thirty five hundred um, you know people that are scattered from hither and yon? Uh, it's a huge uh, ge geographical area, and it's a big force. What, what does it do? Uh, well, we are, like I said, we're an Army Reserve uh, formation. So uh, the soldiers that we have in our formations are from, uh, from the, the places where they serve in uniform. Uh, they're citizen soldiers. They spend most of their lives as citizens, just like you. Uh, but one weekend a month, two weeks out of the summer, and whenever I have them mobilized on active duty, uh, they're doing great things in service of this command and uh, USERPAC and the Greater Indo-PACOM. Uh, area of responsibility across the Pacific. 
Uh, the ninth MSC is uh, a very diverse uh, formation, both in terms of the individuals that serve here, uh, because as you know, there's literally dozens and dozens of different, different ethnicities and cultures and languages in the Pacific, and the ninth MSC has them all, uh, as, as well as diverse capabilities uh, in this command. Uh, I have a Maneuver Enhancement Brigade. I have a Civil Affairs Brigade. I have the only infantry battalion in the Army Reserve. We have an awesome horizontal vertical construction battalion. I have a military police company down in Guam. I have a theater signal company here uh, in in uh, uh, here in Honolulu. Um, I have a I have a schoolhouse, the 4960th Multifunctional Training Brigade that teaches soldier skills such as engineering and uh, and medical and uh, quartermaster, and also teaches our officers on uh, command and control and uh, and leadership out of our uh, Command and General Staff College course that we teach here. Uh, I also have an awesome Army Reserve Hospital, if you can believe that, with over four with over 400 medical professionals assigned. Uh, most of them uh, are are Army uh, civilians in the medical community. So the commander of my hospital is a neurosurgeon. The uh, and I have uh, and the hospital is filled with uh, doctors and dentists and nurses and nurse anesthetists and medics and medical planners and logisticians, uh, uh, all from this region and up in Alaska and, and down in Guam. It's really an impressive capability here at the 9th MSC. And uh, you, you'd be surprised to learn as an Army Reserve formation how much uh, U.S. Army Pacific leans on us to, uh, to bring capabilities to bear to solve uh, the hard problems that we're solving out here. Is it, is it the only, uh, only MSC around or are there others in other parts of the world? Uh, well, so there are three MSCs, Mission Support Commands, in the Army Reserve. Um, the one out here in the Pacific, I'm assigned to U.S. Army Pacific. There's one in Europe, the 7th MSC. Uh, slightly different type of formation, um, but uh, they, they're, they're assigned to U.S. Army Europe and provide, uh, they're, they're also assigned in, and under the operational control of U.S. Army Europe and provide similar capabilities out there. And there's also a uh, 1st Mission Support Command uh, based out of Fort Buchanan in Puerto Rico, and uh, and also a, a very diverse um, formation down there that provides us with a great connection, not just to Puerto Rico, but to the greater Caribbean and uh, and the Army South and Southcom AOR. So if I'm uh, you know joining the Army as a reservist, I I guess that's still you know an enlistment possibility. Um, do I want to be in an MSC? Is an MSC um, you know, good duty, so to speak? Is it something I would want to choose if I could? Well, I think if you live in Hawaii or Alaska or Guam or Saipan or, or certainly American Samoa, it's a great opportunity. You know, there's a lot of people that want to, uh, that, that decide, you know, in high school, either enlisted or uh, going through college through ROTC or, or, or otherwise, uh, they decide they want to serve in uniform, but they really like where they're from. Uh, now, for the soldiers, there are a lot of soldiers out there that, you know, they, they want to make a military career. They want to go on active duty and, and by, by uh, uh, for sure, I encourage them to put on the uniform and go on active duty. But there are many, many soldiers out there, many people out there. And I, and I talk to the high school kids in Hawaii often about this. I've been out to many of the high schools in the, in the, in the Hawaii area and down in American Samoa even. Um, and, I, and I give them my... I, I talk on options and opportunities, and I give them this talk only because, you know, when I went through high school, I don't really remember many people coming to talk to me about the military, so I like to talk to the kids about this and just tell them, look, if you want the uniform on, but you don't want to leave home, you can join the Army Reserve. Uh, you know, you go off to the same basic training and the same advanced individual training uh, courses that your active component counterparts get. And you get to be paid while you're there and doing it, and uh, and and you, and you and you get turned into an American soldier, which is awesome. But then when you're done with that, you get to come back and you join your Army Reserve unit, and you go back and either live with your family or or get reintegrated back to your civilian job, and uh, and you get back to work doing what you were doing before you left. But you get to serve in uniform with your Army Reserve unit, uh, and you're available as a mobilization asset uh, when your nation needs to make the call and uh, potentially have you go and do some hard things somewhere. Well, that would sound like a pretty good pattern to follow. You, know, you can have it your way. Um, what I wonder about the mobilization aspect, though. I mean, uh, I, I can't think of too many moments in the past 20 years, for example, uh, where the reservists have actually been called up. Can you? 
Well, I, I think, well, I, could, I can give you a number of uh, examples just in the four years that I've been here at the Ninth Mission Support Command. Um, it's not always for a contingency. In fact, more often than not, it's not for a contingency operation. Uh, just back in 2018, when Typhoon U2 uh, swept across uh, Guam and Saipan, and really uh, Guam and CNMI and, and essentially flattened Saipan and Tinian, uh, 350 soldiers out of the 9th MSC were mobilized um, uh, both out of Honolulu uh, and, and this headquarters and uh, uh, 300 more out of, out of Guam. And we, we led the cleanup on Saipan, uh, mobilized down there for several months uh, to help, to help the, the mayor of Saipan and the, and the citizens of, uh, of that island. Uh, the, Marines, the Marines covered down on uh, Tinian, which we were greatly appreciative of, and the Guam National Guard covered the damage that was done to Guam. That's just one example. And then when the pandemic started, uh, and in particular my hospital and, and, and my, my headquarters, uh, we, we were essentially, we mobilized nearly 500 soldiers here in the night Mission Support Command on active duty, so that the Army Reserve in the Pacific was postured and prepared in all locations here in Hawaii, up in Alaska, down in American Samoa, and out in Guam and Saipan to, uh, to uh, when required to respond to uh, our nation's calls and support of FEMA uh, activities to support COVID response. Um, you know, a lot of our doctors and a lot of our uh, other capabilities were brought to bear uh, to help bring relief to the civilian community that was trying to get their arms wrapped around this pandemic. That's great, uh, you know, because I mean, there's two schools of thought. Uh, one of them is that the uh, the military in Hawaii uh, can uh, help us in time of extreme weather or disaster, natural disaster, what have you, uh, and we should feel um, comforted by that. There's another school of thought, uh, and I'll be asking you about this, uh, which which says that the military in Hawaii has its own mission, and in terms of the priorities, that mission will have the priority. So you shouldn't count on the military helping you in times of extreme weather or natural disaster. Which one is right? Well, I, I certainly think the former is right. I mean, uh, natural disaster response across the Pacific um, in Hawaii, uh, uh, Guam, and, and Alaska in particular, uh, of course, always starts with local authorities. And when the local authorities get overwhelmed, typically they go to the governor for help. And the next thing, they, the next group they call out is the National Guards of those states. I'm not the National Guard, all right. The uh, the Army, the Army National Guard. I have great uh, friends in the, in, across the National Guard formations in all of those states in Hawaii, Alaska, and, and Guam. Uh, but when when local authorities get overwhelmed, uh, the National Guard steps in. Uh, and when and the, but there are times when uh, the guard at any particular state either doesn't have the required capabilities or or simply gets tapped out. Um, and in which case, uh, the uh, defense support to civil authorities mechanism kicks in, and, and uh, the state requires support from FEMA. FEMA gets uh, authority to work with the Department of Defense, um, and then we engage either uh, from the active component, the first component of the Army, or the other component of the Army that is a federal force, and that's the Army Reserve. And, uh, and with the right authorities, then we kick in with our additional capabilities um, but I think that we've certainly proven time and time again, whether it's now the guard handled the volcano crisis uh, on the big island uh, when the lava flows came through, um, the, the guard in all three states and the Army Reserve and the active army and USERPAC um, all worked together to uh, help with COVID response. Um, and, uh, and I certainly think that we proved between Guam and Saipan that, uh, that the service of the military in particular uh, were, 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 ready, were, were ready and did answer the call uh, when, when those regions were devastated by Typhoon U2. Yeah, you never know these days, you know, in the time of climate change, we could have bad weather any time. And you talk about uh, volcanic eruptions. We have one going on now. It just started. It's not bad yet. It's, it's at the level of tourist interest right now. <clears throat> could get worse. Um, in any event, you know, I, I want to ask you one very interesting and unique thing a quite unique thing about MSC, and that is it has a, an historical connection with the 442nd and the 100th Battalion. Can you talk about that? Well, sure. In fact, I just had uh, some awesome members of the, the Nisei legacy uh, the, uh, and the lineage that they bring to the table. But the 100th of the 442 Infantry Regiment, um, it is the only uh, 
infantry battalion in the Army Reserve. So the Army Reserve is, you know, over 200,000 soldiers and civilians spread across 21 time zones around the globe. And uh, we're replete with the robust levels of combat, combat support, and combat service support capabilities. Our combat arms forces are primarily in aviation and, uh, and engineering and the like, uh, whereas your more traditional uh, combat arms forces in the, in the, in the Army are in, are in the active component in the National Guard, your infantry, your armor, uh, and like in field artillery. Um, but uh, the 100 of the 442 is the only infantry battalion in the third component of the Army and it's assigned out here in the Pacific, uh, where it has a strong historical lineage uh, to, uh, to, to its, its, its uh, performance in World War II. Um, it is widely known as the most decorated uh, unit in the history of the United States Army. Uh, and I don't mean just the Army Reserve, I mean the entire United States Army and the history of, of its existence, the 100 of the 442 is, is the most decorated um, with, uh, you know, well over 100 plus uh, medals, Medal of Honor recipients. Uh, it's also the, uh, the, the, the unit of uh, former Senator uh, Daniel Inouye, uh, who is also the namesake of, of many things in Hawaii, uh, but, but also including uh, this very Army Reserve Center that that I that I sit in now, I you know, and we call it an Army Reserve Center, but it's more like a beautiful campus, um, because uh, and we take great care of it so that our, our local so citizen soldiers have a great place to come and work and train when they when they come to uh, when they come to battle assembly. Uh, just just two months ago, not less than two months ago, I had uh, Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, uh, the Chief of the Army Reserve, the first female. Uh, Chief of Army Reserve, um, career MI officer, brought her out here uh, to see what we do out here in the Pacific. And among many other things that I uh, showcased to her, I brought her out to PTA for two days with uh, the 100th Battalion. And um, she spent two days on the ground in the dirt with, our, with those uh, infantry soldiers, watching them do squad and platoon live fire. Uh, uh, they were firing live tow missile rounds, and uh, and she actually got to go see the the mortar the mortar section the mortar platoon um, hang some mortar rounds. Uh, so she got to drop the mortar rounds and uh, herself uh, probably fired about uh, four or five uh, mortar rounds herself, and they got to experience all the awesome things. That, you know, the hunt of the four four two. People often talk about their historical lineage and most decorated. Uh, unit in the history of the United States Army, and somehow for some people that equates to, oh, they're, they're, they must be some sort of honor ceremony now, like like the old guard, uh, but that's not them at all. They're, they are a legitimate, uh, full-up, light infantry uh, battalion um, trained to fight and win our nation's wars, just like any other infantry battalion in the Army today, and they are very good at it. You're telling me that there are people right now in the 442nd who are doing duty for the United States Army in the 442nd today in 2021? Oh yeah, uh, if, if, if that wasn't something made abundantly clear, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, the, the, they, we just had a brand new uh, battalion commander take over, Lieutenant Colonel Perkins, um, career infantry officer, fired up and ready to go. Uh, but they take, the, the, right now, in fact, and just to give you an idea of, of uh, how things go often with the, with the local community in the 9th MSC, um, I've established with the commanding general of the Ar Hawaii Army National Guard, uh, Brigadier General Moses Kiave from the Hawaii Guard, good friends, good friends over there at the Guard. I've established uh, a cross-component partnership with the 100th Battalion in the Army Reserve and the 9th MSC is partnered with the 29th Infantry Brigade Combat Team out of the Hawaii Army National Guard. And they're on a three-year training glide path, if you will, uh, uh, a path towards building collective readiness where the infantry battalion here has the opportunity to plug into a brigade higher headquarters and train, learn how to train and operate together on the battlefield together. And, uh, you know, they were doing some stuff this last summer, uh, uh, just two months ago out on PTA. Uh, they're going to do uh, another combined uh, a collective training exercise together next summer. And then ultimately the summer after that, they'll go to the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk in Louisiana. Uh, and do a very robust collective training uh, exercise together. And uh, it's just a great partnership. Uh, it's great to work with Hawaii Guard, uh, great to partner with our, um, you know, our fellow citizen soldiers from the, from the National Guard side of the house uh, in such uh, awesome training. But the, the 100th of Battalion from a fighting capabilities perspective to get direct at your question is absolutely alive and well. 
you know, I can just see two guys, two guys in a bar talking and uh, one says to the other, what unit are you in? And the other fellow says, I'm in the 442nd. And the first guy falls down. He, he's in a dead faint. Okay. And, yeah. and when he wakes up, he says, you're 442nd, but you're so young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll tell you, um, the, the, the soldiers today, they embrace the spirit of the, the brave heroes that came before them. I can say that without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I, I watched them perform in tough conditions that day and night, um, you know, just over in PTA. So and the tradition the, continues. Tradition absolutely continues. I got uh, I got the, the, the Echo Company down in Guam. Uh, I got Bravo Company down in American Samoa. Uh, the, the soldiers that fight out of American Samoa, they are they are they are fierce uh, competitors and uh, you know just uh, military athletes. Um, if, if you ever need someone to help me carry around about 150 pounds of ammunition on their back, uh, just just call somebody from Bravo Company and they'll take care of you. So what's what's it like uh, to be? Yeah. What's it like to be in the reserve and in, in you know one of these units and subunits? I mean, how often do you have to go? Um, I suppose there's a lot of different kinds of things you could do, but how many days or hours per week per month are you expected to provide? Does it is it the same for everybody or different? And can you give me a handle on how much you get paid as officer or enlisted? Just a rough idea, because I, you know, I was in the Coast Guard Reserve, and uh, after my active duty, uh, I was always surprised how much they paid me. Uh, it was it was impressive. Uh, also, um, you know, what, what what do you have to do? What do you have to be to succeed in these jobs? Well, so so that you, you've covered a lot of terrain there. Um, why don't I start with the last question? What do, what do you have to be? Um, well, the, the, the Army, there is a vetting process uh, in, in, to get into the military. Um, and uh, the military loves folks that are fit, um, loves folks that do uh, relatively well in school. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I, what I would encourage all, of, all the kids out there to do, that if they're interested in enlisting in the military after, after high school or, or during their senior year of high school, go, go see the recruiter. And you'll sit down and you'll take an ASVAB test. Uh, and that recruiter, if you're really interested in uh, doing certain things that, that the Army or the Army Reserve in the Pacific has to offer, uh, they'll set you on a right path of preparation to make sure you're getting trained and fit and studying the right things you need to study to do well in that ASVAB so that uh, once you get that GT score uh, and it's high enough uh, and you demonstrate a level of fitness, um, the, the military, uh, you know, you know we, 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 we don't take folks that do drugs. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we encourage kids throughout high school to uh, keep a clean record, don't get in trouble with the police, uh, you know, be good, be, be good model students and citizens uh, in your local community, um, and, uh, you know, and so you can pass a background check. Uh, so when you come on board, uh, those, those types of things aren't issues when, uh, when the recruiter wants to work with you and, and uh, get, you, get, you to, uh, um, get, you, get you squared away with a contract. Um, so that you can join the military. There's a lot of benefits in joining, uh, even the Army Reserve uh, or active duty. Uh, you, you get access to a lot of benefits, medical benefits, uh, the educational benefits, the, the GI Bill. Um, I know many, many soldiers that have paid, paid their way through college uh, based on their ability to, to um, join the Army Reserve uh, and, uh, and put that uniform on. And a lot of people are just very reluctant to take that step. They just think it's such a huge leap. But once they do, um, I've rarely met anyone that regretted it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as far as pay, I'm not going to pretend to memorize the pay table, but I will make one thing clear. Uh, the pay of, of a soldier at every level, enlisted an officer alike, is a matter of a public record. All you have to do is Google it or uh, go to your internet search engine of choice and put in uh, 2021 uh, uh, military pay, rate, pay tables. Uh, and you will be right, brought, brought right to the internet site that uh, shows what, what you're paid from E1 all the way up to the four-star generals of the Army. Um, and, uh, and, and it's broken down also between active duty and reserve component. So when you come in and let's say you join the military and you work your way up to E5 or E6, like Sergeant Acevedo sitting in here in the room with me, uh, and you drill one week in a month, you go to that pay table, it's going to tell you, hey, you're an E6 and you've been in service for four years, it's going to tell you how much you can you can expect to make in base pay. 
Um, and then when you're also in the military, if you're on an active duty order of some, of some sort, um, whether on active duty, you also get additional entitlements. You get a basic allowance for housing. If you're living off post, you get a basic allowance for subsistence. This is all in addition to uh, your base pay. So in addition to your base pay, they're giving you an allowance for housing and an allowance for, uh, for uh, to give you an ability to put food, in your, food on, the plate, on the table. I'm going to have to talk to you, Sergeant Major. I hope I'm not too old for this. Uh, maybe. <laughs> We'll bring you back. Yeah, happy to have you back. You always use a good lawyer. <laughs> I, actually, for a time, I was a military judge. Matter of fact. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to I wanted to ask you also about change. You know, there's nothing so constant as change itself. Everything changes, and you know, our geopolitical position in the Pacific is certainly very important, and it is changing. It is changing because we want it to, and because we need to have it change to comport with other changes, you know, to wit, um, you know, the deal that the, that the president made with Australia and Britain over nuclear submarines. It's an example of a, a you know, a dramatic change in the Pacific. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, how do all these changes uh, affect MSC? Where do you see MSC going in the next few years? Is it sort of relative to the army in general, relative to the, to the military in general, and in the Pacific in general? Um, what, what are the, what, what kind of evolutions do you see happening? Well, I think that's a great question. I think the biggest uh, evolution that we've seen relative to the 9th Mission Support Command, again, as uh, under the operational control of uh, U.S. Army Pacific and General Flynn, um, and uh, General Flynn, who uh, 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 is educating us and educating the Army on what it means to have a, uh, a theater army out here in the Pacific. There's two theater armies in the world, uh, U.S. Army Pacific and U.S. Army Europe. And the, and the theater army is responsible for uh, the, the land, all land component aspects of uh, the things that we need to do across the Pacific AOR to assure our allies, deter our adversaries, and ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. And uh, General Flynn, thanks to his leadership, um, has challenged the 9th MSC, uh, among other things, to, um, we, we, we've adopted an area uh, in the, across the Pacific Island countries, uh, you know, commonly referred to as Oceania, so countries as far east as Fiji and Tonga and as far west as Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste, uh, and all the COPA states, uh, Palau, the Republic of Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. We've, the 9th MSC has been uh, given the uh, awesome uh, mission to partner with the United States embassies in all of these countries and uh, establish uh, a presence with all of them. So. Uh, so with many of these countries, I have boots on the ground, uh, wearing the ninth MSC patch, and they're working with the U.S. ambassadors from all of these nations um, to help uh, bridge ties between not just not just the Department of State in those countries, but also with the host nation governments and the host nation militaries for the countries that have them. Um, and the whole idea is uh, with this is to uh, ensure these countries and these embassies that uh, USERPAC is an important uh, lead element in the Pacific for the Department of Defense and, and Indo-PACOM uh, is present and engaged with these countries, uh, and uh, we're working with them and working through uh, working through their concerns, uh, and uh, we're working to support each other. Uh, we're not we're not just working to make them better; they help make us better as well uh, in these countries. But uh, all of the nations. Uh, the 9th MSC, because again, the 9th MSC is, is from the Pacific. Um, all of the countries I've mentioned, I can, I can almost guarantee you, I have soldiers in my formation as American citizens who are actually from these countries. And, and they, they're from these countries, they have family in these countries, uh, they, they know the culture, they speak the language. Uh, when we sit, when, and, and, and many of the soldiers that are from these countries are part of my uh, team that's executing Operation Pacific Island Countries. Uh, across Oceania, and, and and this is just one example. This is the this is a main effort of what the Ninth MSC is doing in a very real sense uh, to help uh, user pack with uh, ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, making sure that uh, we have the right partnerships and partnerships in place to uh, to have access to these countries when we need it. Um, but we're also engaged in many other areas. You know, my 322 Civil Affairs Brigade, which is very engaged in Oceania, is also engaged up in, up in Japan. I have my 303rd Maneuver Enhancement Brigade is partnered with Joint Region Marianas. Um, we're just, uh, we're, we're engaged in adding value 
I, I like I, I said this is at a recent user fact commanders conference I looked at the at, at around the room to all the different commanders that are part of user pack and report uh, and are accountable to general Flynn and I said if you're in this room there's a pretty good chance the ninth MSC has some sort of partnership or relationship with you uh, and that's and that's the absolute truth whether it's be the guard or the 25th ID or the 8th TSC or 8th Army or U.S. Army Japan or Joint Region Marianas out in Guam I, I just it's just uh, it's an amazing organization. I'm more blessed than I deserve to be able to, to be able to command it. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, um, Afghanistan. You know, we had 20 years there. The uh, army was involved for sure over that 20 year period, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on troop levels. Um, and now that's over. We're not there anymore. So my, my question to you is uh, here we are halfway around the world. Uh, how did Afghanistan affect the MSC, uh, your MSC? And how did the departure from Amazon, how will that affect uh, your MSC going forward? Well, so, so the Afghan, the, the situation in Afghanistan is certainly complicated, right? Uh, I served a year in Afghanistan myself back in 2009. Um, and, uh, you know, people will probably debate for years whether or not uh, we should have stayed or gone and, or, or whether or not we, 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 uh, did it right or, or did it otherwise? Um, that's that's really not uh, my my place to say in this particular discussion. I, I you know the, the, even the, the some of the senior leaders of the army did did express um, some concerns or put some messaging out that that may, that perhaps there were there were soldiers out there uh, that were that were having some uh, mixed feelings about what had happened in Afghanistan and uh, and and that it would be necessary for us to. Um, extend resources to those soldiers so they had someone to talk to, uh, and uh, if they if they felt like uh, they needed someone to talk to about how they were feeling, uh, in case they were feeling any confusion. Um, and uh, and the reality is is that there are some soldiers out there that are having those feelings, um, and uh, and I want those soldiers to you know somehow be able to find you know if they need to talk to somebody, just like we did during the pandemic, and the pandemic was bringing people down. Uh, and uh, last year, last year we went through a significant period of, of uh, civil unrest and racial tensions, and um, the and the results of the Fort Hood investigation came out. Uh, these were all hard topics, um, and uh, and I think the Afghanistan situation is is similar in that it's also a hard topic uh, that we as leaders need to be able to sit down with soldiers and be willing to have hard conversations. And I think the senior leadership of the military has encouraged us to do that, uh, to sit down so that soldiers feel like if they have something they need to get off their chest, uh, th they can do that. And, and so the impact uh, on the 9th MSC, I think from a soldier uh, morale and motivation perspective um, has, been, uh, has been mitigated to the degree that um, I think I've I've tried to do my part and my command sergeant major has done her part and all of my leaders have done their part to make sure that uh, through all of this, uh, this period of, uh, of discord, I'll call it, whether it, whether, you know, going all the way back to last year and the start of the pandemic and uh, again, the racial tensions and the civil unrest and then Afghanistan now, that, that soldiers simply have someone to reach out to and talk to, whether it's uh, mental health professionals or uh, the chaplain, or just having a battle buddy. I say here all the time in my own command, have a battle buddy, be a battle buddy, and be awesome to everyone. And, uh, you know, if I, if I, I just tell soldiers, you know, being awesome to everyone is all about just treating everybody with dignity, respect, and a genuine sense of inclusivity. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, the chief of staff of the Army has said, you know, if, if we could just crack the code uh, and treat everybody with dignity and respect, uh, the, Army, the Army would be able to uh, resolve a lot of the issues that, that it faces today. Yeah, uh, in many, many ways, the, the military is, um, you know, it's, uh, it's the repository of national values, just as you said. Yeah. Uh, one yeah, last question, you. General, just one last question, and, and uh, they're going to tell me to get off already. Uh, yeah. I can talk for hours. <laughs> and that is, you know, what's it like being a general? How do you get to be a general in the army? And when you wake up in the morning as a general, um, do you have to put your, your trousers on one leg at a time? Uh, or can you put you know, your trousers on both legs at a time? How does that work? 
Well, uh, you know, I, I've often said the moment that you think you should be or want to be a general uh, might be the moment that you probably shouldn't be one. Um, it's, uh, it's a tremendous and awesome uh, responsibility and obligation, and you have to enter it with a degree of humility um, and an open heart and open mind and a willingness to engage with soldiers at their level so that you understand what they're going through and don't lose connection with uh, what, what, what it is really we're asking them to do. And in the Army Reserve, that's even harder, right? Because for a multiple multitude of reasons, uh, we get fewer training days a day. Uh, a year, I'm sorry, we get fewer training days a year. Uh, but by and large, we're asked to perform on the battlefield uh, on par and at the same level as our active component counterparts. Because you know, when, once you get there, the enemy doesn't say, "Oh, I'm not going to shoot as, as many bullets at you guys because you're the, you're the reserve component." Uh, that's not how it works. Um, so I tried to focus my generalship on uh, doing good. You know, uh, I've had a couple of senior leaders give great advice when you become a general officer is use your rank for good. Uh, I try to take that to heart and, and uh, use it advice. Uh, um, and, you know, you just, you just need to embrace a notion of humility because at the end of the day, no, nobody fights the fight alone. It's all about the team. And, uh, you know, being a general and being a commander, I think it's just all about understanding that when you're in charge, you got to take charge. And when you're in charge, you got to provide vision, uh, provide guidance, and make decisions. Uh, and, and after you do those things and you still haven't covered down on everything, you have to assume risk on behalf of your subordinates so that they have, uh, so that they feel empowered. Um, with the, with with the resource to to get after the things that you're asking to get after. You know those principles don't don't are not limited to the military. I have to say, those pr principles are a good lesson for leadership everywhere and anywhere, and good good rules to follow. Um, so uh, if I want to know more about MSC, if I want to know more about uh, becoming a reserve, where do I look? Where do I go? Well, I think a great place to start, uh, you would go to www.usar.army.mil uh, is, our, is our website. Um, you can also go to goarmy.com. And, uh, and, and, and if you go to goarmy.com, there'll be a link for your recruiter. Um, and then if you, you, if you, if you go to usar.army.mil or, or, or usar.army.com um, and you go into the subordinate command sections, you can, you can uh, work your way through there and find the nice mission support command and our local phone numbers. Um, it's always easy to find a recruiter. And uh, you can also follow us on Facebook. Just just type on Facebook, 9th Mission Support Command or 9th MSC, or on Instagram uh, as 9th MSC or 9th Mission Support Command. Uh, and, uh, and, and encourage everyone out there to, to follow our pages. Uh, we're always posting awesome stories. Uh, I got a great public affairs section that's post that always posts great stories about what we're doing in Oceania, what are, what the hundredth battalion is doing in training, uh, whether it be on PTA or elsewhere, uh, and what the rest of our formations are doing across the Pacific, up in Alaska, out in Korea, uh, down in American Samoa, and whatnot. So uh, please follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I think we have a couple other social media uh, uh, avenues out there as well. Uh, and ask that everyone jump on those and, uh, and follow us. Uh, Brigadier and General that's... Timothy Connolly, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really been great to talk to you and to learn from you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Jay. I appreciate it. Aloha.